Thank you so much for, for having me and uh, I appreciate interruptions and questions throughout the, the, the talk. Um, so feel free to stop me at any point in time. So this is joint work with Carter Braxton at the University of Wisconsin, Nisha Shikali, who is on the market this year and uh, is a great uh, uh, co-author, should take a look at her, and Gordon Phillips at, at Dartmouth. So as all of you probably know, the revolving credit markets have boomed over the last 50 years. The 1970s credit cards were in their infancies. We really didn't have home equity lines of credit or HELOCs. About 18% of households had some type of access to revolving credit and the bankruptcy rate stood at about 0.1% uh, per capita. Fast forward to the 2000s, the combined credit card and home equity line of credit limits exceed 26% of GDP. 72% of households have access to credit and the bankruptcy rate increases by a factor of six. What we're after in this paper is to what extent and through what mechanisms does parent access to credit affect the future outcomes of the children? We're then going to develop a structural model to ask how the expansion of credit from the 1970s to the 2000s affected inequality and intergenerational mobility. To answer the first of these questions, we're going to, to develop a, a new database. So um, this, this is a culmination of, of quite a bit of years of, of legwork, uh, dealing with like legal teams at, at, at TransUnion and at the census to link the, the credit reports to the decennial census, which provides us with family structure. Um, and then we're able to link that to the LEHD, which tells us about the children's outcomes later in life. And you may be asking, well, I've seen many papers on credit and child outcomes. Almost 99% of those papers are access to credit and college attendance. And then the few panel data sets that exist in the United States, the PSID and the NLSY, they do not collect information on borrowing capacity. So some of them have very limited information on debt. So you might see a household with sort of a small amount of debt and you have no idea whether that person is constrained or unconstrained. You don't see limits, scores, or borrowing capacity. You can make some inference using liquid asset positions, but to our knowledge, there's no database in, in this country or any other country that provides the borrowing capacity of the parents side by side with the, the outcomes of the children. So what we're gonna do is take this database and use two instruments. So here, we're really not going to innovate. We're gonna rely on existing instruments that are out in the consumer credit literature. The first of which is automatic limit increases. And I'll go through that in, in a moment, but your account limits increase as a function of account age. Gross and Solilis used this in their, their uh, QJE in 2002. And then there's derogatory flag removal. So when people go bankrupt, the function of simply the time since bankruptcy, those flags must be removed. And you can compare people on either side of that flag removal to have some idea of what credit access does. So what do we find? Under both of these instruments, we find that a 10% increase in unused credit among the parents, so a change in their, their limit. Children earn something like 0.3 to 0.4% more in, in the labor market. That's about a factor of five to 10 times less than if I had just given them a dollar of income, okay? So if you wanna benchmark this mentally, sort of what is the magnitude here, it's about a factor of five to 10 times less than if I had just given you $1 earnings to, to the parent. We find is that the, the children are more likely to graduate from college, which, which uh, shouldn't be surprising given existing studies, actually some even in, in, in Chile with uh, very nice RDs. Um, work at, they work at higher paying firms and they're less likely to have an unemployment spell. What differs between our work and, and even any of the international data sets is we find that the non-college children also benefit significantly from the greater parental credit access. 
So we're going to go through this and suggest some mechanisms, but we're still in the process of digging more in that uh, in that area to pinpoint what exactly matters for these kids that don't don't go to college. Kyle, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you something? Uh, just to it's a very fine question. You mentioned orders of magnitude with respect to giving uh, families an extra dollar. But this is not giving them extra income. This is just giving them extra credit for unforeseen shocks, I guess. But the, the yeah. income remains exactly the same. You're exactly same. right. Yeah. So this it's relaxing like, the borrowing constraint. That's it. Yeah, it's just relaxing the borrowing constraint. So I'll okay. I'll be very clear. So like when people run these regressions, it's like kid earnings on the left hand side parent earnings on the right hand side. And what we're going to add there is the credit limit. And the ratio of those two coefficients is a, a difference of almost five to 10. But you're right, this is a borrowing limit. This is not income, but just the ground, you know, people have this intergenerational earnings elasticity in the back of their mind. And that's a regression of the kids' future earnings on the parents' uh, uh, contemporaneous earnings. I'll, I'll I'll be clear with that, but yeah, this is this is conceptually different from giving them income. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take sorry, these. Sorry, yeah. Very simple question. So so the effects on on, on uh, college uh, graduation and um, probability of being employed at higher firms. What's the magnitude of those? Are they large or? They're rel they're rel they're relatively small. So I'll I'll show you. So like a ten percent increase in parental unused credit increase the graduation rate by about 0.1%. And if you were to try to say, explain all of this earnings variation through simply going to college, you would have a college wage premium, the implicit college wage premium would be sort of off the Richter scale. So what actually really matters is in generating these, these, these premium are actually the non non college children. And we're going to have a couple hypotheses. Um, have to do with parental earnings risk and when they get shocks, do you simply pull the kids out of the neighborhood, you move them, et cetera. We're, we're working the census on getting those detailed results, but that that's really where, where the action is. Okay. So let me, um, which kind of aligns with like a lot of the other RDs are saying like, you know, the inframarginal movements with, with respect to credit limits are fairly small, um, for college graduation. Um. So let me let me describe the model briefly. So we we take these empirical estimates um, and uh, we map them. We force the model to match the regression estimate. Okay. So we're going to do simulated method of moments, and we're going to run. So the beauty of doing the bankruptcy flag removal instrument is that there is selection into bankruptcy, and none of these instruments are perfect. But what the model does is gives us a, 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 a sort of frontier way of simulating that selection into bankruptcy. So we are going to model the bankruptcy process. That we're going to model bankruptcy flag removals, and then we're going to do an uh, apples to apples regression comparisons. We run the same IV with the same variation, the same issues with selection in the model, and we're going to match that. And then we're going to back out the underlying fundamental parameters using the simulated method of moments and use the model for counterfactuals. Okay. So you could use the regressions for counterfactuals, a lot of issues with that, but we're going to match the regressions, uh, you know, fairly well and then use the model for the counterfactuals. And what we find is that <clears throat> if you were to tighten limits in the 1970s, and and increase the cost of bankruptcy, which is how, it's how we view that early regime. And then you were to compare it to the modern era, which is larger limits and fairly cheap bankruptcy. You would find what you would expect with the credit limits. So if you expand credit limits, um, you find that the lowest earners benefit from this. So they're able to, to borrow more against their income effectively against their, their child's future income, invest more in the children. And what this does is increase mobility at the low end. What was uh, surprising to us, but shakes out of these defaultable debt models is that the bankruptcy regimes matter significantly more than the extensive margin of these limits. So 
when we increased the cost of bankruptcy to get the bankruptcy rate right in the 1970s, um, we find that going from that really costly bankruptcy regime in the 70s to the cheaper bankruptcy regime in the 2000s, what it does is it reduces precautionary savings across the board. So the, the cheap bankruptcy in the 2000s, it's like a safety net. And so individuals invest less in, in, in assets, which is kind of what you see in the data. People save less and you have a, a lot more people hanging around zero net, net, net worth. But they also invest less in their in their children. It's just another asset and make a portfolio choice in these models. And what this does is actually puts downward pressure on, on mobility. So those who benefit most from the safety net are the ones who are able to, to cut back expenditures the most. Quantitatively in these models, the cheaper bankruptcy dominates and the larger limits, cheaper bankruptcy in the 2000s actually reduce mobility. So this is very... Uh, counterintuitive uh, if you're just thinking, well, credit is uh, uh, the great equalizer and allows for the democratization of, of, uh, of access to, to capital markets. Um, what this does is puts upward pressure actually on, on inequality. You can shut this down. So each of these channels you can turn on and off. And uh, if, if this is, this is uh, uh, offensive to you, then the, the larger limit exercise here, you can you can read this. And, and that's sort of what you would expect if you just uh, move limits uh, independent of changing the, the bankruptcy rates. Um, all right, so this is this is the outline of the talk. So uh, we're going to spell out the new micro data. I'm going to do the reduced form. OK, and neither of the instruments are perfect. So let's just say that up front. But what we're going to do is uh, simulate the instruments, this particular the flag removal in the quantitative model. And then we're going to run these counterfactual experiments uh, where we look at mobility and inequality. So let me tell you about the data. So the data is going to be about 5 million TransUnion credit reports. So um, we've been working with 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 the TransUnion credit reports for, for a while and, and linkages to, to the census, we bought quite a few more and we're looking to, to go further back in time. But um, we had to go through a bit of legwork to get, to, to actually get the, the legal clearance to, to do these merges. And we, were man we managed to link them to the 2000 decennial census, which um, includes the family structure. So it includes who, which parents are linked with which kids for the universe of, of individuals in the in the United States. We then link that decennial to the LEHD, which is the matched employer employee data. And this is not the universe. Okay. So there's we have about 24 states. Not every state has to participate in the LEHD, and some states opt in and out, even in the duration of the life of a project in the census. Uh, that covers about 44% of, of the population. This goes from all states are really in the data set by 2000. There's actually one or two late entries. There's a few regimes, but we really can't go further back in the LHD. And the 1990 decennial census is not picked, so they haven't. Uh, I mean, there's, a there's I think, I believe a beta picked version, but we do, we do not have access to that. But uh, you're going to see that that's going to matter because it's going to limit the the time frame which we can study and sort of how young we can look at the kids. So this is the the standard uh, intergenerational elasticity regression. So if you ignore this green term, this credit term, these regressions typically take the form of children's earnings YIC on the left hand side at some future date on parental earnings at some lag date. And this beta is what uh, many people report. So Lee and Solon sort of in the PSID would estimate a beta of something like 0.3 to 0.4 for, for, for men. So male earnings to, to male outcomes for 40 year old children when they're at the age 40. We're going to find smaller estimates here, and I'm going to explain why, but we have a shorter panel and we include both men and women. The log C 
what is going to be the new bit, which is the credit access. And there's lots of ways you can define credit access. You could define it as a borrowing limit, as a credit score, or as we're going to an unused credit limit. So the amount that you haven't drawn down. We include the paper, the limit as well, and and the credit score. And I've got backup slides on those. We can talk about that more, but um, you find very very similar results. Um, these are cross-sectional regressions. You know that there's no T here, okay? So you see the parents in the decennial in the early years, and you see the kids later in life uh, when they've entered the labor market, but there's no panel here. So there's no notion in which you could, let's say, even do an event study around, you know, a flag removal, okay? So these are, we're going to use these actually as, as, as IVs, but the kids are not earning any money at the time that the flag comes off. So there's no scope for, for event studies here. You could think of RDs, and if you have ideas, we're, we're, we've got open ears, but um, we're going to show you um, uh, uh, a few different instruments and happy to hear your opinion about uh, any other potential instruments. So how are we going to measure YIC. So we're going to use an average of the children's earnings between 2013 and 2014. And here you're really going to see us constrained in the, the window in which we can view the kids. Okay. We're going to take the children age 25 to 30. Um, so hopefully they're out of college at that point in time and in the labor market. But we don't know when there's a zero what's happening. We don't know if they've left the state. Um, and we don't know, let's say, if they're um, in graduate school or something else, if they're just a string of zeros um, and they do, you know, seven year economics, <laughs> whatever. Uh, we would not necessarily know that. So if you receive the stipend in that future, we would actually have you in here. But what we have to do is limit this to children who, who earn at least $10,000 in that time period. So we're going to condition them on having positive earnings, okay, and above this threshold. And when we go to the model, we're going to map apples to apples. We're going to pose the same earnings threshold in our model. The parents' earnings, we can measure between 2000 and 2002. And if you do the math, the children are the are aged between 13 and 18. Okay, so they're somewhere at the start of high school. The benefit of being able to go to future years or go back beyond 2000 is we can look at kids that are, you know, 10 years younger than that. So between 3 and 18. But right now we can't because we have the 2014 LHD snapshot. So we've applied for a 2021 snapshot and we're trying to get the 2000 decennial. It can be the 1990 decennial, but this is, this is the earliest we can study the children. You can study the children earlier if you move this age window earlier, but then you're gonna start getting a lot of zeros and people who are still in college um, uh, uh, distorting the sample. So, CI, this green term, this is the credit access, and we're going to use the unused revolving credit limit. So this includes home equity lines of credit and bank cards and credit cards, um, anything that has a defined limit. Um, that data set starts in 2001, so we take a 2001 to 2002 average, and then I can show you credit limits and credit scores if there's any interest in that. So that's regression framework, cross-sectional parent income on the right-hand side in 2000, kids' earnings in 2014, credit access of the parents in 2000, okay? So let's talk about the instruments. Um, we're going to show you two instruments, and then what we're going to do is show you over-identification tests. So, First instrument we use is the age of the oldest credit account. Uh, Grosser Solis used this in their, their QJE when they're studying the permanent income hypothesis. And what they did is just studied these credit cards as they aged around six months and 12 months and 18 months limits jump discreetly. Why do they jump discreetly as a function of account ages? Well, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, COA, made it illegal to use age or other demographics in the credit score. So, of course, what the credit rating agencies did was they started using the age of the oldest account 
as a proxy for the physical age of an individual. Okay, so the age of the oldest account in the credit scoring formulas that are public and online determines something like 15 to 20 percent of your credit score. So there's a huge loading on the age of your oldest account. Credit scores and credit limits increase automatically as a function of account age, as I've described. So in six and 12 and 18 months, they bump your limits. And that, that limit increase is a function, obviously, of your, your credit score. So while the rating agencies do not see your physical age, they only see the age of the oldest account, we see the physical age. So what we can do is condition on the physical age, so it's not a life cycle uh, component that we're picking up, and use variation in the age of the oldest account. You might think, well, there's going to be selection into who took out the, 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 the credit card at what ages. And so if I took out my credit card at 20 and you took out your first credit card at 30, you're probably not financially sophisticated if you took it out at 30. Or your parents could have a lot of wealth. There's stories here that, that threaten, the threaten the plausible exogenate of this instrument. We're going to argue this instrument is conditionally exogenous because we observe the ages of the parents and their income levels. We're going to proxy for wealth using cumulative lagged earnings, their home equity, and equity in, in, in cars. And uh, on top of that, we can do very restrictive windows of when you took out your credit card. So we, we, we can restrict the window so that we're not comparing people who took it out when they're 20 and took it out when they're 30. We can narrow the window to look just around, you know, people who took it out between the ages of 20 and 24, 24 and 28, 28 and 32. And within those subsamples use this variation. We find very similar results. But um, the argument here is for conditional exogeneity. So the second instrument is derogatory flag removals. So this is going to be cleaner variation in some sense, but it's going to apply to a smaller sample of households that may not necessarily represent the total US population. So uh, this has been used quite a bit, you know, going back to David Musto's work. And the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires derogatory flags to be removed after 10 years. The only exception is Chapter 13, which has to be removed after seven. It's some sort of incentive. Chapter 13 is a repayment plan, so it's an incentive to, you know, you enter the repayment plan, and punishment is in some sense uh, milder. The, the, the flag removals cause a discrete increase in credit scores and limits, uh, but not in income. I mean, this is what our two papers were really about uh, in the, the mid 2010s was uh, trying to look at, you know, uh, outcomes in the labor market for the parents, and it doesn't move the needle much there. So you can think of this as just moving scores and limits, but not changing, let's say, job prospects or other sources of income. We're then going to compare those who have their flag removed effectively while the kid is 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 in the house and in high school to those who have the flag removed when the kid is older, okay? So here, if you read this, you know, new staggered difference in difference and stacked difference in difference estimators and, and delayed treatment, here we are comparing a control group that is eventually treated, okay? So this flag comes off when your kids are in your house for the treatment group, and then the flag comes off after 2004 for the control group. So really what we're comparing is there's a difference in, in credit access of a few years where we believe that there's an investment occurring in the children. And as I mentioned before, this instrument is going to be very um, amenable to simulated method of moments because we are going to have a process of who selects into to bankruptcy flag removals, who invests in their kids during that process. And we are going to construct an identical treatment and control group in the model. So we can um, we can provide a lot more uh, analysis when we interpret this through the lens of the model in terms of selection and if this represents the US population. In the paper, we have a third instrument, which is a mortgage purchase cohort variation. I'm not gonna show you that. But because we have multiple instruments, we, we can run over identification tests. So the J test is 
sort of notoriously underpowered and the hypothesis at least one of the instruments is valid, but the intuition is, is very simple. You take one of the instruments, you run your IV and you save the residuals and you check if it's correlated with the other instruments. So we do these J tests, we do these over identification tests and, and, and the age of the old credit account conditional on our controls passes the J test in flying colors. But there is no true test of exogeneity and there's, there's multiple threats to the, the exogeneity of this particular instrument, but the benefit is it applies to all households, okay? So if you're willing to buy the conditional exogeneity, this is perhaps our broadest set of estimates, if you're not happy with that, the derogatory flag removal comes closer to, um, to, to the cleanest variation we can get, but a narrower subset of households for which this applies. Okay. One yeah. quick question. In the ID flags that are removed, for the ones that are removed after 2004, do they know uh, beforehand that they will be, these flags will be removed in the future? You you do know it's just a, it's just a ten year window, um, and what we do see is that uh, prior to the flag removal, individuals obtain credit access, but there's a discrete jump at the flag removal time. Okay. So, yeah, it's you know lenders and the households themselves would anticipate that in the model we're going to to have some notion of anticipation of removal, but. Um, we're going to model the flag removal stochastic in the model. So you have some expectation that's going to be removed. We don't know exactly when. Okay. It requires to add a state to, to like perfectly map it to the expectation that like it's going to come off with certainty at a certain time. Um, something that we've discussed, but I'm happy to hear guys thoughts on how convincing our model mapping is to, to the data. Um, okay. Hi. Hi. Another yep, question. Uh, is there a way you could uh, introduce? Uh, did Ernesto freeze? Increasing the credit good. score yeah. uh, relative Ernesto, to the distance. Ernesto, hey, you, part of the question. you froze. You froze. We heard. Oh. I could not understand what you were saying. Go ahead. What about now? Yep. Go for it. Okay. Course. <laughs> you again. that if you no. get your credit score, get uh, you, your credit get limit, you know. Okay, I understood nonlinear effects, and yeah, we what we could do is look at small and large increases, and I think that you know who's inframarginal here, you know these local average treatment effects, who sort of nudges over, you know, parents into having greater credit acts, what, you know, which instrument nudges over which parents to having greater credit access, investing more in their kids. Between these two, the flag removal is the largest sort of nonlinear increase. We're going to see larger point estimates here, but what we haven't done, what we should do is like bucket them into like smaller and larger increases. And we're also working on bucketing them by, by lag deciles of income. So looking at whether or not the effect is interacting with like you start out with very low income and you had a large limit increase. We are not, we're not there yet, and that's a good idea, and we're working towards that. There was another question. Yeah, I um, I, I help. Yeah. Can you go back to the the slide where where you show the the equations, the regression? Piece? Yes. Yes. So I understand that ADA here is the the parameter of interest, but uh, yes. beta could be um, inconsistent, right? If you, if you don't instrument for the for the income of parents, right? And so, and, and actually, I remember you said that you that you get a um, a smaller estimate, so it could be due to because you're not, it could be due to that, to, to the fact that you're not uh, instrumenting the, the income of the parents. And we, so that, that's, I have a single question. So let me, let me uh, say it. And then, so the, the, so my second question is on the distribution on the credit variable. Um, do you get 
too many zeros on on that variable? So yeah, so that's a good question. So all right, on on the like instrumenting the YP, what we're gonna do is apples up. We're gonna do what Lee and Solon do, which is just regress, you know, child on parent earnings and not have a credit variable there, and we're gonna get smaller numbers in them. I think it makes sense. Like you would want to instrument the rental earnings and like Nate Hilger does this with like layoffs, you know, mass, mass uh, layoffs at, at plants. We haven't done that. Something we could consider doing um, on the credit and the zeros. That's actually something that uh, we, we actually had to think long and hard about. So with credit scores, it's fine. With the unused limits, there's many zeros and there's even negative numbers. So we use log plus one. And if you're negative, we're going to set you to zero. So that's very clearly spelled out on the paper, but I haven't spelled that out here in the slides. But uh, that's actually an issue for, you know, small chunk of the sample, but a, a group that you wouldn't want to throw out. So, um, so think of this as uh, log plus one. And we Windsorize the uh, the 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 unused credit limit at zero. Yeah, because because uh, I would think it more than than the fact that you're using the log function. But I would think in that when you have too many zeros, you don't get too much variation to I don't know to 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 set up your your ID strategy. I don't know how, so, how how good or or powerful uh, are your first stages. Uh, powerful, yeah, good first. I've had backup links on those. Um, so we have, you know, a lot of variation here in in, in unused limits, but the credit score really alleviates those those issues. I mean, people with zero limit will still have even the unscored have an uh, a number. There's a different range for them. Like they run these. My understanding is they run some other formulas for these unscored as they're trying to develop the scores. So we we um we use both of those. Um but this is something that um open to suggestions if you have other ideas here. Um so let me let me show you let me show you some of the, the stuff that I'm describing. So I'll start off with these summary statistics uh for, for the main sample interrogatory sample. So the parents earn roughly 10,000 parents have to earn $10,000 in 2000, 2002 children have to earn $10,000 between 2013 and 2014. That defines the main sample. Derogatory sample is then the main sample and the intersection of that with those who have their flags removed between 02 and 08. So that includes the treatment and control. The main sample, the children earn $35,000 in 2013 to 2014. That's their average earnings per annum over those two years. They're about 27 and a half when we see them in 2013, 2014. Parents earn about $45,000 in 2000, 2002, and they're about 43 years old uh, between 2000 and 2002. Evolving credit limits, you see a very large mean here, but as Chris just suggesting, these are these are skewed, right? So there is some subsample of individuals who do not have a credit limit or it's a zero. Um, and I haven't released statistics on that, but we should. Um, but I do have some some summary statistics down here that might indicate a little bit more about who's constrained and who's not. The, the unused revolving credit to, to income ratio is about 50%, but that's highly skewed mean. Um, so there's a really big fat tail to the right. Individuals with very little income, like effectively retirees with very large limits, okay? But these parents, they're fairly young, but you still have this fat tail of individuals with fairly low earnings and, and, uh, and significant limits. But uh, uh, give you a better sense of what that distribution looks like, you know, you can get a sense of how skewed it is with, with about 40% of individuals can't replace or can only replace 10% or less of annual earnings with their unused credit. So about half of them can replace about, you know, quarter of their annual earnings with, with unused credit. When you go to the derogatory flag sample, you see that the kids earn slightly less, parents earn slightly less, but they they have significantly smaller limits, 
and they're much more constrained. But this is not zero. So, you know, going to Sophia's question, this this indicates significant credit access even prior to the flag removal. But then we, we see a significant bump at flag, flag removal. In our model, unlike other models, when we map this to data, we are going to allow them to, to have some limited credit access when they're bankrupt. Okay, so we're going to be able to, to match these types of numbers. So there's 23,000 parent child pairs here and 166,000 parent child pairs here. Kai, Kai so, I have a question. Yeah. I probably have asked this before. Uh, what is a derogatory flag? That's the first question. And yep. the second one is, do you lose many observation when you condition on the earning of the children being larger than 10K? Uh, and worry about yeah, the population yeah. there. Yeah, so we, yeah, so that we, we also worry about sample selection there. We don't have any statistics released on how many we lose, but we should release some, some information about that. Um, you know, most people will stay in their home state, uh, despite relatively high mobility in the United States. But so it's, it's not a lot, but we should have some official number, like what percent we lose. Derogatory flags, we're going to lump together bankruptcies, foreclosures, severe derogatory events, and uh, in tax liens and judgments. So anything that's a public severe derogatory event that lowers your credit score, we're going to lump together to try to get as much power as we can. Um, and uh, all of those events have to be scrubbed after 10 years. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so this is this is the benchmark regression. So this is the OLS. This is the parents' uh, earnings on the right-hand side and the credit, and this is the children's earnings on the left-hand side. And this is like your standard intergenerational mobility elasticity, so the IGE. So this is kids' earnings on the left, parents' earnings on the right, and you have an elasticity of about 0.16. So parents earn earnings goes up by 10%, the kids' earnings goes up by about 1, 1.5, 1.6%. Again, if you look at the kids when they're older, so you're much older and you restrict male to male, you can get numbers to get up all the way up to 0.5. Um, but what we find here is the number like 0.15. Others who have used ELHD also find similar, similar estimates. In a derogatory flag sample, the persistence is a little bit lower, so a bit more mobility actually in the derogatory flag sample. If we add the credit variables to this regression, what we find is that um, a 10% increase in unused credit is associated with about a 0.1% increase in children's earnings, and it lowers the IGE slightly, and about a 0.1% increase in children's earnings for the derogatory flag sample. So I should have been clear about this, but down, down in the bottom here, we describe which sample the column corresponds to. So this has no controls, no fixed effects. This is just the raw data. And uh, if you're not happy with the instruments, you can stop here. We could use these as auxiliary targets in, in the modeling exercise. But uh, this, is, this is what we get. So borrowing capacity matters for, for kids' future earnings over and above the income of the parents. All right, so let's talk about the age of the oldest account. First, uh, this applies to the broadest sample, and um, and I'm going to give you some rebuttal to a couple of the the potential threats to to exogeneity here. So, greater parental credit access once we in instrument it, the the coefficient increases. This is not what we expected. We expect the instrument to actually lower the the coefficient slightly, but the local average treatment effects who the age of the oldest account nudges over to sort of invest more in their kids this is probably the lower income sample. So uh, we're going to discuss this more in, in a moment. But what we find is when we instrument the credit variable, we find that a 10% increase in unused revolving credit limits is associated with a 0.3% increase in the child's earnings. 
Now, I brought up a couple of reasons why this, this might be endogenous. One is that simply wealthier parents or parents from wealthier dynasties, kids take out their credit cards earlier or later. Um, what we find is when we put in very rich controls for the parents' wealth, so we use cumulative lagged earnings in the LHD, so we tally up how much they've earned over their, their career, and we use proxies for, for home equity. So we see the, the, the highest mortgage balance less than the, the current, and we put in controls for whether or not they have a car and a car loan, et cetera. We get a slightly lower coefficient of 0.28. You might say, well, you know, the age of the oldest account may just reflect financial sophistication as well. So we put in a bunch of controls for what we're going to argue is the, 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 the financial sophistication of the household, which are just lag delinquency controls. So even though our data, the transient credit reports stop in 2001 and we can't go further back in 2001, they have all sorts of variables. Like what was the most recent time you defaulted? How many accounts have you defaulted in the last 10 years? How many accounts have been 30 days late? How many have been 60? How many have been 90, et cetera. So you can put in these fairly rich controls for. I would claim our proxies for financial sophistication. It really doesn't do do a lot to these point estimates. Second, we go to our derogatory flag instrument. So if you're unhappy with these controls and sort of proxying for these threats to exogeneity, we we show you what happens when we use our derogatory flag instrument. And the coefficient here is is larger, but you can just inspect the confidence intervals here. We can't reject equality, but the point estimates make sense in that uh, the bankrupt households are more sensitive to to credit, but not by by a lot. Maybe twenty percent larger, thirty percent larger coefficient. So we have two instruments. So we have the flag removal instrument and the age of yields account instrument. So we can run the over identification test that I described before. So. These are orthogonal sets of variation, very different sets of variation. One has to do with how old your accounts are. One has to do with the time since your last bankruptcy. And we also do this with the mortgage instrument. And, and the J test here is that we simply can't reject the null that the instruments are valid. So a very high P value here on this, this J test is, is a good thing. Okay. So this is like passing in flying colors. I do believe. You know, all of these stories have some element of truth to them. No instrument's perfect, but what we're going to do is try to map this flag removal to the model. Talk seriously about selection. So, so the flag removal, there's selection into bankruptcy, right? Did you get there because you had job loss or was it a non job loss related event, like a health shock or something else? And the time since bankruptcy may reflect how far away you are from, from this particular event and when the event occurred. Um, so we're going to take a stance on that through through the lens of the model. We're not able to go back in time in terms of earnings or surveys to like back out why you went into bankruptcy. We can't see that. But in the model, we're going to have a we're going to take sort of the frontier defaultable debt model. We have people defaulting because of earnings losses and expense shocks, which we're going to think of as health or divorce shocks. And we're going to take seriously these point estimates in the column four and dig deeper into them. Okay. So, Craig, I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. The, the, um, <clears throat> does this instrument, the age of older account, uh, uh, is it a strong instrument? In the derogatory sample, uh, it's a it's a it's a very strong instrument. So, uh, I mean, I understand the logic for the main sample, but for the derogatory, F, yeah, the F the F stat. So the derogatory flag. I mean, the F stats oh. are all of like like a hundred, but super high. Um, yeah, this is like a it's like the derogatory flag is like fifty percent increase in in unused credit. And the age of Neil's account is, um, uh, you know, in levels, it's like, you know, 0.1%, you know, increase for every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, I, I was thinking so. about the, this, this instrument, but for the, the regulatory sample, which is, I suppose, the, the, the column five. 
Yeah. So you this is our J test. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there are very different sets of, of variation. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Okay. So the links sort of work. I went. All right. Let me just see. There we go. Um, all right, so a few questions you might also have, which is, you know, is this, do these effects persist over the age of the children? There's not a lot for us to do here, given the very short panel, but we can look at children who are aged 25 to 27 in 2013 to 14 and 28 to 30, and the effects are fairly persistent. So this black line is the baseline, and uh, we see the effects are, you know, persistent. We can't reject the quality of those coefficients, but... Um, you know, it's not something that's petering out over time, which suggests it might have to do with human capital. Um, the parents, whether the parents have college degree or not, so this this maybe we should space this a little bit more. That that's parents non college. Their effects are are significantly larger than parents with a college degree. So you can think of this as like a very raw income split, but like lower income parents react more than higher income parents. Now, this is the new bit that, you know, you just, you don't see in the LSY, PSID, or international data sets, which is that uh, the children who don't go to college, the non-college children have point estimates that are significantly larger, something like 25%, 30% larger than the children who, who go to college. So, we're conditioning on an outcome variable here. But the idea would be if there was no effects on the, the non-college children, so it's all working through college, we would expect this coefficient, this bar to be zero. Okay. And if it was just working inframarginally on who attends, attends college, it would it would load entirely on on, on, on this bar here. I'm not gonna have a lot for you. I'm gonna show you some mechanisms, but we're really digging hard on on this bar and sort of why it's so much larger here. And in our intuition, like Jonathan Zinman has a very nice paper in Oregon and was looking at payday loans and sort of how you smooth shocks when you have access or don't have access to payday loans. And you think of a lot of, of households, especially that are lower income, when their car breaks, how do you get the kids to school? When you lose your job, can you maintain rent and continue attending the, the various, you know, in this case, high school, but for younger kids, childcare facilities? Car brakes, do you fix it yourself or do you take it to a shop? And, and Zinman found for these payday loans that those mechanisms were present. So when somebody's car broke or <clears throat> let's say a nanny didn't show up, you would have differences in, in significant differences in time use among the, the parents. So like the parents would fix the car themselves and potentially the kids would not go to school. So, you know, we're working on digging into what's what's generating this bar. And another big one is geographic mobility. <clears throat> so we're hoping to, to have some tighter answers for that. I'll show you what we have done. So we've looked at a bunch of mechanisms here. The kids are more likely to go to college, which you have already said, but the elasticity is fairly small. So 10% more unused credit, 0.1% more likely to go to college, 0.2% <clears throat> more likely, I mean, 0.2% higher earnings, conditional unemployment. So this is like a wage rate. Less likely to be unemployed, 0.1% likely, but I'm less likely to be unemployed and more likely to work at a higher earning firm. So, excuse me, higher wage firm, higher average pay per employee. So what we need to do, what we're working on is putting various mobility metrics here in the interim period. So between 2000 and 2010, um, we're working on getting the 2010 decennial linked up so we could see, okay, well, did the parents have earning shocks for the non-college kids? How did the parents react? Do we see them go into delinquency on their cars? Do we see them change where they live? These are the types of questions we're hoping to dig in in the future, but I don't have those answers right now. So we've 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 shown you like an intent to treat that I give you greater limits and the kids do better. Do they actually draw down the limits? We we show yes. Households borrow something like 
10 cents on the dollar of the unused limit. One thing, you know, a lot of mac macroeconomists on the phone, so this is like not going to be surprising, but like the policy rules change whether you draw down or not. It's a safety net. So you change your behavior. You go to a slightly more costly school, you buy a slightly better home in a better neighborhood. You may not draw down your credit line, but you change your behavior, you change your, your policy functions. Um, and these, of course, are the realizations which you did get the bad shock, right? And so we do see some borrowing um, and we see something like five to nine cents on the dollar borrowing. So you can't do this in logs. If you do this in logs, the numbers won't make sense. So this is levels. This is a change in the parent's revolving balance over the subsequent four-year window. And this is their unused revolving credit limit 2000. A number of 0.09 means you borrow nine cents on the dollar in that subsequent period or something like five cents on the dollar in that subsequent period, okay? So, we do we do some robustness. Uh, this these links are not uh, bluffs; they actually work. <laughs> so, like we do look at revolving credit limits alone. So there is some concern that because we look at limits minus balances, um, that there's endogeneity in the balances that we're not addressing. So we do it just with limits, and we find very similar elasticity, slightly larger elasticities actually. Second, um, as Krishna was asking about the zeros, we, were, we, we use credit scores, which essentially not subject to this, this concern. Um, and uh, we map the credit scores to a limit and then the, the limit to, to the outcomes and we find very similar elasticities. So that was, uh, you know, um, a relief for us that these all yielded very similar estimates. The mortgage purchase cohort variation, we can talk about that later because I'm going to run out of time. And we put in county fixed effects. So this is not just parents with greater earnings or credit limits start off in, in better neighborhoods and their kids just do better and has nothing to do with credit. That That's not the case, okay? Um, lastly, you might think, well, the credit limits affect the future earnings of the parents. So it's not just working through credit limits, it's working through also like income and job prospects of the parents. So what we do is we control for the, the parents' future earnings growth and future earnings, we find very similar estimates, but what we really need to do through the lens of the model is interact the two, is say, you know, in between 2000 and 2008, did you have income shocks? Interact that with your buffer and then run the same auxiliary model in run the same auxiliary regression in our structural model and compare the two. So we're not, you know, we're not quite there yet, but this is what we've done in terms of in terms of the empirics. So with with that, um, we're gonna blast off into the model and I'm I'm gonna go fairly quickly here and not summarize so much. Um, so we're gonna use the model for the counterfactuals. We're gonna map the model to those estimates. So we're gonna develop a model with overlapping generations, heterogeneous households. There's going to be uncertainty over income and expense shocks. So the income shocks are like Warren, what Sullivan, Westbrook and Warren, you know, in their seminal book in, in, in the 90s, surveyed bankrupt households and asked, why did you go bankrupt? And something like a third of it had to do with job loss. Okay, but the rest, the other two thirds are things like civil judgments and divorces and health shocks. And what we're gonna do is lump that all into an expense shock. So you just wake up in the morning and your net worth is lower and uh, you file for bankruptcy. Parents are, parents are going to invest in their children they invest in their children's human capital. They're going to make your standard Bewley's saving borrowing decision. And then we're going to have at the end of the period, a default binary default decision. We're going to fix pin down the risk free rate and then price the debt according to an individual's default risk. So this is, uh, this is the timeline of the model. Every time somebody shows me one of these life cycle timelines uh it's just tune out so i hope uh you know to 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 highlight the one important segment here and you can tune out for the rest so the the kids are kids are born 
they enter adulthood, so they don't have a kid. And I should say here, each period is four years. So the kids are born and uh, at age uh, 20, they enter adulthood. They make consumption savings and default decisions themselves. At uh, two periods later, at the age of 28, 28 to 32, you are endowed with a child. There's a lot of verbs we could use there, but endowed is the one that we chosen. Uh, happily endowed. And then your parenting is going to make a consumption. Your parents are going to make a consumption savings decision. You're going to make a default decision. And the key bit here is the parental investment. This this stage here, when you have a kid, when you're making the investment decisions and choosing whether or not to default, that's what I'm going to focus on. And the rest of this, the transfer to the child, I'll show you briefly. And the post-child working stage, I'm not going to show you in the slides. Okay. So kids are born, they enter adulthood, they themselves have kids. There's a decision about investment, and then the kids leave the house and you give them some money. And then after that, you you work and save and you're independent from the children. So the credit market's fairly standard. So you borrow, B, B less than zero means that you're borrowing. Um, and uh, you use one period unsecured loans here. You're gonna default on your outstanding debt subject to utility penalty. So you need this utility penalty in finite life cycle models, otherwise the credit market unraveled. The only punishment for default is I kick you out of credit markets. In the last period of life, the threat has no bite, just default. So then you roll the, the, the model back one period. And if you're gonna default automatically in the future period, then the threat of excluding you in that future period from credit markets has no bite and the whole credit market unravels. So you need some utility penalty. You can think of this as like Bula or Rogoff, right? You need some penalty over and above. <clears throat> The, the reputational costs support credit in equilibrium. We're going to place a flag on the credit report if you default. So this, this is N. So like your credit report is N, no credit access. Except you're not quite going to have no credit access. We're just going to give you a tighter borrowing limit. So you're still going to have some ability to borrow, and that's what we see in the data. The flags are then removed stochastically at a rate P. So going, going to Sophia's question about anticipation, there is anticipation. You expect the flag to be removed, and you know the probability with which it's removed, but we remove a state variable when making it stochastic, um, something that we could, we could work on. Like, make it deterministic two-period flag removal might be a better mapping. To, to the data. So yeah, open to, to uh, thoughts on that. Um, the debt's priced as in Eden Gersovitz, the discount on the face value of the bond Q is proportional to the probability that you repay over one plus the risk-free rate that yields zero profits in equilibrium. But as you all know, these bond prices, they, they mechanically tie the pricing schedule, the R and the Q, in a way such that the limits, the implied limits are, are counterfactual. So if you were to compute where this bond price reaches zero, in most instances that far exceeds the limits that we observe in the data. There's a lot of ways you can fix this and the work that I've done with Carter, we've built models of credit lines and working on a simple model of credit lines to address these issues. What we're going to do here is just impose an exogenous credit limit. So this does not change the profitability of the contracts. It's just you can't touch certain contracts. We're going to, we're going to impose an exogenous limit that depends on your income and your bankruptcy status. So you could have credit access or no credit access, and you're just going to have different limits. So um, the process for human capital wages, pretty straightforward. Your human capital is going to map to, to your wage through an exponential function. And then the parent's human capital is going to be unit root. So if this is your human capital today, you draw a shock with mean a, a mu and, and variance sigma squared of eta to determine your human capital tomorrow. When the kids are born, there's imperfect transmission of the parent's human capital 
to the children. So rho c here determines that imperfect transmission. Lower values of rho c, if rho c is zero, your parents don't have any bearing on the kid's human capital. And then eta c is the randomness there that's involved in, in that process. Lastly, the most important bit is the investment function. So the investment function is Cobb-Douglas. So if you were to exponentiate this, it's Cobb-Douglas. What does this say? Well, the future human capital of the children is going to be some loading on what the kids walked in with and some loading on an investment amount that the parents make, some public investment, which you'd think of as a school. And then some people call this an anchor, but it's just the relative price of investment. So if 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 Xi C Zeta C drops a lot, then what you're gonna have is uh, very cheap investment goods. Omega C is going to be your Cobb Douglas exponent on investment. And we're going to estimate that and we're going to estimate the anchor. You might say, well, is Cobb Douglas a reasonable approximation of the data? Lee and Shashadri have a beautiful piece in the journal Political Economy where they estimated a CES version of the human capital investment function using the PSID time diaries and the PSID test, uh, letter word test. They found epsilon deviation from Cobb Douglas when they estimated that functional form. So we're going to blast off with Cobb Douglas and reference them as uh, the support for that choice. Okay, so this is the Bellman. If you put all those things together, parents who have credit access C and are in life cycle stage J, they only have a kid. So we're looking at ages 28 to 47. And they're going to make an investment and human capital investment decision and savings and borrowing decision. So the parents walk in with some net worth B, some human capital H, and their kids have human capital HC. You're going to determine how much to save B prime and how much to invest in their children. Subject to they're going to maximize their equivalized consumption within the household. So this pi is just a constant 1.5. Discount the future. There's some expectation over their future human capital. They're then going to make a choice of whether or not to repay, which is this branch, or to default on their loans. They default on the loans, the loans are wiped out. The budget constraints are very standard. Consumption plus resources borrowed plus investment in the children must be less than or equal to earnings and what they walked in with in terms of net worth. They're subject to an exogenous limit, and that's the law of motion I showed you on the last slide for human capital. So investment in the children determines human capital tomorrow deterministically. So this expectation operator doesn't realize any risk for the children. This is a lot of notation, but it's like purely with defaultable debt and an investment choice in the children. When the child leaves home, this is sort of the last interesting stage of development, which is you're going to choose to transfer to the child. You have some altruism parameter theta, and then that's the value function of the child. So we do not take the like Doboka Flynn Wiswell shortcut where you just directly value the human capital of the kids. We have you directly value the payoff of that child going into the world with human capital HC and income transfer tau. Uh, I am going to run out of time very quickly here. So um, agents in bad standing have a tighter credit limit and they have their flags removed exogenously. I already told you about these expense shocks. Um, I showed you Bellman's without the expense shocks just to not junk up the notation, but uh, with probability PX, your assets decline by a value X in the morning. So this generates non-income loss uh, default uh, decisions generates bankruptcy driven by non-income factors. The equilibrium here is block recursive in the sense that given the risk free rate, you just have to solve this back once, uh, the life cycle model, solve it back once without simulating agents forward. Um, so four year period, sigma two, risk free rate of 4%. Where do these sort of key parameters come from. I'm going to go through these slowly. So 
The first is row C, which is your parents' human capital is H and your kids' human capital is HC. So this is the intergenerational elasticity that's going to pin down that persistence, the transmission from parents to kids. So you're going to see that here in this row. And the model is going to be a bit high. All right. The investment in the children, the effectiveness of how much you invest in your kids and what that pays off for the kids' future human capital is going to be pinned down by omega C. The share parameter that Cobb Douglas is going to give you that elasticity of the kids' future human capital to investment decisions. So, what we do here is we run the bankruptcy flag IV and we match the coefficients. And I'll talk about that more on the next slide. And then the anchor, the relative price of investment, is to get the investment to earnings ratio right in Lee and Shashadri. In the credit market, the bankruptcy penalty is pretty simple to pin down. That pins down the bankruptcy rate. The borrowing limit, the exogenous borrowing limit that we impose, we're just going to estimate the constant to match credit limit to earnings. And then we're going to put a slope, a simple linear slope parameter on your earnings. And we're going to take that from the SCF. So there we directly estimate the relationship between earnings and and borrowing limits, and we take that coefficient from the SCF. So those are the important elements. What we're going to play with in the counterfactuals, we're going to move psi around, and we're going to move credit access around alpha C and delta C. We're not going to alter the persistence of earnings. We're not going to alter these intergenerational parameters. Our estimates are in line with the existing literature, very in line with Lee and Shashadri, although our share on income is a little bit lower than what um, people typically find in the literature. So one thing we do in the model, and that I'm going to have to go through fairly quickly, is we replicate the bankruptcy flag removal in an apples to apples manner. So we're going to define the treatment and the control criteria identically. So the treatment, the flag comes off in the, the, the second to last investment period and the control, it comes off right after that investment period. So this is like the kids are 13 to 18 when the flag comes off and the kids are older than 18 when the flag comes off. We know that there's selection into bankruptcy. So what we can do, we know that there are, on average, they're gonna be lower human capital, lower B, et cetera. So what we can do is, is split the, the regressions into very fine cells. So we can do that in the model, split them into very, very fine cells, run the regression in every cell, and then reweight the cell-specific estimates to correct for selection, okay? So I know, you know, when I look in the data, it's unobserved to me what your human capital is and what your net worth is. But in the model, I know both of those variables, and I know there's selection into bankruptcy on both of those variables. So what we do is we run the cell-specific IVs for people who are below median net worth, above median net worth in the year prior to the bankruptcy. And we find, obviously, that the largest effects are among the low net worth households with no effect among those with moderate levels of wealth prior to filing bankruptcy. And this is the data OLS, and this is the data IV. This is the model OLS, and this is the model IV. So in the IV, the credit flag removal, because of the selection of the sample, it's larger than the OLS coefficient. And when we correct for selection, the selection corrected model estimate lies almost on top of the OLS estimate, slightly smaller. But what you need to do is take the IV coefficient and downweight it by 60% to get the correct for selection. And it's exactly what you would think. There's just lower human capital, lower net worth individuals in bankruptcy. They are more sensitive to credit. So you downweight the IV estimate and you get a selection correction factor of something like minus 65%. So go, you could go back to our IV tables, multiply it by um, point uh, four four, and you're going to get pretty close to to what we think is the true population estimate. The model lines with the life cycle profiles of earnings. We we run the same borrowing regression in the model and data. People borrow ten cents for every dollar of unused credit in our model. Five to nine cents in the data, and then the precautionary motives are going to be important in the counterfactuals. And um, you might ask, are we on 
we have reasonable degrees of precautionary motives, and we use Karina Bohr's job market paper to argue yes. So, uh, I can just go two minutes over time. I'll show you the main counterfactual, and then we can stop and uh, talk talk about the, the take questions. So, the 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 credit limit is given by a constant and a slope. And the bankruptcy penalty is just a constant times the amount on which you default. Now, the way that we're going to do the counterfactual is we're going to estimate what alpha C is in the 1970s to match average credit limit to earnings ratios. So, on the X axis is the year of the SCF, on the Y axis is credit limit to earnings. SCF actually doesn't collect credit limit data until 1989. So what we do is fit an exponential regression here to tighten up the limits back to the 1970s value of uh, 0.03. You could run a linear regression that would be even more aggressive. Actually, it would be a negative number in the 1970s. But you could think of you know you can project back to get some guess of what limits were in the 1970s. We do the same with bankruptcy. So in the 1970s, people filed for bankruptcy a lot less. And what we infer is a bankruptcy penalty that's about 10 times larger than what it is in the 2000s. Because people borrow less, the actual consumption equivalent of that bankruptcy penalty is not a factor of 10 difference. It's much smaller. But uh, the bankruptcy penalty itself has to be a lot larger to generate the very low bankruptcy rate we see in the 1970s of 0.1% per capita versus almost 1% per capita in the 2000s. So you stick all that together and you compare the 1970s credit institutions to the, night, to the 2000s credit institutions holding everything else fixed, holding income risk fixed, holding the price of investment fixed, holding everything else fixed, Cedarus Paribus. What we find is in the 1970s, the intergenerational earnings elasticity is lower. That means the loading on your parents' earnings is lower. That means more mobility. So lower beta in that regression or a lower IGE means more mobility. In the 2000s, there's less mobility. Your parents' earnings matter more for where you earn, for the amount that you earn. We see an increase in inequality between the 1970s and 2000s and a difference in the variance of consumption. So there's more inequality in the 2000s despite this sort of uh, increase in limits. And then this is really the main show. So this is average earnings is one in the economy and these are lowest earnings households. These are the highest earning. On the y-axis is child investment to parent earnings. In the 1970s, lower income households actually invest more in their children. But they're saving more and they're investing in everything more because the, the bankruptcy penalties are very tight. So this pink line is if we just look at the difference in bankruptcy penalties between 1970 and 2000. In the 1970s, the bankruptcy penalty is so high that the low income individuals, the lowest earners save more and they save more across both assets. They, they invest more in their children and they also save more in financial assets. Credit limits do what you think. So in 1970s, if you tighten up the credit limits, the low end suffers the most here, but I'll, I'll leave it there. So the rest of the slides were to try to make that point. Sorry for going over time. Happy to, to, to hear any questions or thoughts you guys might have to improve the paper. So thanks a lot, Kyle. Uh, we can open the floor now for additional comments and questions. Okay, so so I'll start. So, so the, the the back. So you get as you just showed. So most of this result on on the sort of adverse effects of, of credit on, on the inequality and mobility come from the penalty, right? That, that's what I understand. From the difference in the penalty between the 70s and the 2000s. No? So, yeah. how, how do we think about the penalty in sort of in, in sort of in concrete terms? What's how 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 we because it's like a utility penalty, right? So, so how how do you think about the what the bank bankruptcy penalty is actually measured? So, I think there was. I mean, 
there was a, a sort of a series series of bankruptcy reforms in the last, you know, between 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot more in terms of the democratization of access to 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 bankruptcy institutions. But um, you know, in the 1970s, it was costly to to retain a lawyer and to go through the process of filing. And even now, it's still quite costly. But um, you know, like even, but you know, a lot of it. But we don't have mortgages and things in our model, or like changes in the homestead exemptions. So, you know, bankruptcy just looks a lot more generous now than it did in the 1970s. So you can go through bankruptcy and keep your house now, etc. Um, but those we don't, you know, it's a very abstract mapping from that to Sai. I'll take that. Yeah. And don't, don't, don't. So therefore, those those are also gains from these lower members. Right? Like you can, like things that, not, that are not in your model that are benefits from having this potentially this lower bankruptcy cost, right? Like keeping your home and yeah. all those things are sort of would have well to to sort of the effects of of, of the credit. Yeah. No, you credit, could, right? If you know these models, Matias, you would know that you know you're worse off if the penalty is zero. Yeah. You're worse off if the penalty is infinite, but there's actually relative to current bankruptcy regimes, most calibration would predict you want stricter bankruptcy. So in some sense, you're better off. Actually, I don't have the welfare numbers here. I fairly certain there's a small gain from going to the 1970s institutions. So despite the tighter limit, the sort of greater bankruptcy costs uh, actually improve market completeness here. There's many other things that change between the 70 and 2000. So if we change the income process and we make the price of investment and schooling lower, it may actually look much better in the 70s. So if income risk is lower, yeah. price of investing going to college is lower in the 70s. The bankruptcy penalties are more in line with what you know, optimal policy would come out of these models. You might actually get significant welfare gains going to like the 1970s regime. Um, but uh, we haven't done that yet. Okay, yeah, because the, the cost of school, the cost of schooling has like is super different from between the two. These thirty yeah. years. Yeah. So that you could we can like. None of these decompositions would change if we move the schooling. There might be an interaction, but you could imagine moving the price of investment between the two, and you can turn that on and off. So you can think of this as we we turn that off, and then we turn off the limits, and we turn off the bankruptcy penalty. It may be that that interacts with the bankruptcy institution, so the order in which we do the decomposition will will matter. Um, but if you order the decomposition that way, the price of investment would just be like another line here in, in in this graph. So yeah, this is C this is Cedarus Paribus just move the but it's something we should do. I mean that and uh yeah we we have not we have not explored that quantitatively in the model yet. So that's yeah that's a fair point.